Beginning with the acknowledgments. The creation of a novel is more than just the effort of the writer. There are many people involved in bringing a story to fruition, and every single one of them deserves credit for their contribution. That word fruition, likely a new term to define. Let's write that down as a vocabulary word. Notice how our author, Neil Schusterman, recognizes our interdependence. There is no such thing as an individual. We are all interdependent beings that depend on each other for life. There were editors, there were book agents, there were friends, there were other writers that gave Neil Schusterman feedback as he worked through the creation of his work. Not only that, but all the teachers and all the books and all the people Schusterman met helped him become the man he is, and so all of them take some credit in the book. You see Mr. Schusterman thank many people, and we see that this book is going to be made into a film. And that makes me ask, how do you imagine the film version as we're reading? Imagine how you would direct and stage this if you were a director or a filmmaker. Part one, robe and ring. What is connotated by robe and ring? We know the denotation, the direct dictionary definitions of robe and ring, but what are the connotations associated with the words? Well, if I look at the cover and then I think of robe and ring, I get a very soothsayer-like vibe. Uh, the robe is crimson on the cover. It's long, it's flowing. That and the ring combined together make me imagine some sort of wizard with a ring of power that does something magical. That's what I see in my head. I'm sure you see something different. Let's begin with the first journal entry. We must, by law, keep a record of the innocents we kill. And as I see it, they're all innocents, even the guilty. Everyone is guilty of something, and everyone still harbors a memory of childhood innocence, no matter how many layers of life wrap around it. Humanity is innocent. Humanity is guilty. And both states are undeniably true. Notice the innocence, the choice of that noun that this journal writer admits that she kills. Do you agree uh, that humanity is both innocent and guilty and that both states are undeniably true? And if you do agree, why? We must, by law, keep a record. It begins on day one of apprenticeship, but we do not officially call it killing. It's not socially or morally correct to call it such. It is, and has always been, gleaning, named for the way the poor would trail behind farmers in ancient times taking the stray stalks of grain left behind. It was the earliest form of charity. A scythe's work is the same. Every child is told from the day he or she is old enough to understand that the scythes provide a crucial service for society. Ours is the closest thing to a sacred mission the world, modern world knows. Perhaps that is why we must, by law, keep a record, a public journal, testifying to those who will never die and to those who are yet to be born as to why we human beings do the things we do. We are instructed to write down not just our deeds but our feelings because it must be known that we do have feelings, remorse, regret, sorrow too great to bear, because if we didn't feel those things, what monsters would we be? Okay, we get a definition for the word gleaning uh, they don't say killing, they say gleaning. We see this is taken from ancient times when uh, the poor would trail behind a farmer taking the stray stalks of grain left behind as charity. Of course, the scythe is a tool, a tool to uh, you know, harvest grain and, and harvest uh, things from the field. Of course, before machinery, this is what you would use to harvest. This is a service the scythe performed a sacred mission, the author of the journal says, as to why we human beings do the things we do. Well, go to TED.com and watch Tony Robbins' speech, Why We Do What We Do, for insight in that. Remorse, regret, sorrow, uh, these are heavy words, and think about the denotations and connotations of each. You have to feel these things, the author says. And if you didn't, what monsters would you be? From the Gleaning Journal of H.S. Curie. Now, draw a monster 
right now. Draw it in your head. What does it look like? What are the characteristics of it, the attributes? What does it say? What does it do? What does it sound like? Why is it a monster? Now, odds are you drew something that was, you know, had claws, sharp teeth, big, hairy, scary, gross, ugly, right? That's a monster. And yet it's not. The real monsters, they look like you. They look like me. They look like human beings. You cannot tell someone is a monster just by the look of their face. Let's go back to the 70s and Ted Bundy, the serial killer who apparently was a good-looking guy. And nobody could tell the man was a monster just by looking at him. Nor can we tell monsters just by looking at each other. Chapter 1. No Dimming of the Sun The scythe arrived late on a cold November afternoon. Citra was at the dining room table, slaving over a particularly difficult algebra problem, shuffling variables, unable to solve for x or y, when this new and far more pernicious variable entered her life's equation. Notice the word pernicious. You want to define that term. Notice the use of a metaphor, her life's equation, and of course the introduction of our protagonist, Citra. Guests were frequent at the Terra Nova's apartment, so when the doorbell rang, there was no sense of foreboding, no dimming of the sun, no foreshadowing of the arrival of death at their door. Perhaps the universe should have designed, di deigned to provide such warnings, but sighs were no more supernatural than tax collectors in the grand scheme of things. They showed up, did their unpleasant business, and were gone. The last name of Citra is Terra Nova. Uh, can you define Terra Nova? Do you know what that word means? Terra means Earth. Nova means star. Terra Nova, Earth star. Her mother answered the door. Citra didn't see the visitor, as he was, at first hidden from her view by the door when it opened. What she saw was how her mother stood there, suddenly immobile, as if her veins had solidified within her, as if, were she tipped over, she would fall to the floor and shatter. What is suggested by the use of this metaphor? If you tipped her over, she'd fall and shatter. Strength? Or fragility. May I enter, Mrs. Terranova? The visitor's tone of voice gave him away, resonant and inevitable, like the dull toll of an iron bell, confident in the ability of its peal to reach all those who needed reaching. Citra knew before she even saw him that it was a scythe. My God, a scythe has come to our home. What does Citra's reaction tell us about the entrance of this scythe? Is this a wanted thing, an unwanted thing? Yes, yes, of course, come in, Citra's mother stepped aside to allow him entry, as if she were the visitor and not the other way around. He stopped over the threshold, his soft, slipper-like shoes making no sign, sound on the parquet floor. His multi-layered robe was smooth, ivory linen, and although it reached so low as to dust the floor, there was not a spot of dirt on it anywhere. A scythe, Citra knew, could choose the color of his or her robe, every color except for black, for it was considered inappropriate for their job. Black was an absence of light, and scythes were the opposite. Luminous and enlightened, they were acknowledged as the very best of humanity, which is why they were chosen for the job. Notice color used as a metaphor here. Black is the absence of light. White is all colors. Uh, scythes get to choose the color of their robes. Some scythe robes were bright, some were muted. They looked like the rich flowing robes of Renaissance angels, both heavy yet lighter than air. The unique style of scythe robes, regardless of the fabric and color, made them easy to spot in public, which made them easy to avoid, if avoidance was what a person wanted. Just as many were drawn to them. The color of the robe often said a lot about a scythe's personality. This scythe's ivory robe was pleasant and far enough from true white not to assault the eye with its brightness. But none of this changed the fact of who and what he was. He bowled off his hood to reveal neatly cut gray hair, a mournful face red-cheeked from the chilly day, and dark eyes that seemed themselves almost to be weapons. Citra stood, not out of respect, but out of fear, shock. She tried not to hyperventilate. She tried not to let her knees buckle beneath her. They were betraying her by wobbling, as she forced fortitude to her legs, tightening her muscles. Whatever the scythe's purpose here, he would not see her crumble. Notice Citra's, Citra's vow to keep her poise. It's difficult to keep your poise in such a situation, and she vows to. It tells us something about her character. You may close the door, he said to Citra's mother, who did so. Although Citra could see how difficult it was for her, a scythe and the foyer could still turn around if the door was open. 
The moment the door was closed, he was truly, truly inside one's home. He looked around, spotting Citra immediately. He offered a smile. Hello, Citra, he said. The fact that he knew her name froze her just as solidly as his appearance had frozen her mother. Don't be rude, her mother said too quickly. Say hello to our guest. Good day, Your Honor. Hi, said her younger brother, Ben, who had just come to the bed from the bedroom door, having heard the deep peal of the Saya's voice. Ben was barely able to squeak out the one-word greeting. He looked to Citra and to their mother, thinking the same thing they were all thinking. Who has he come for? Will it be me? Or will I be left to suffer the loss? I smelled something inviting in the hallway, the Scythe said, breathing in the aroma. Now I see he was right in thinking it came from this apartment. Just baked ziti, your honor, nothing special. Until this moment, Citra had never known her mother to be so timid. That's good, said the Scythe, because I require nothing special. Then he sat on the sofa and waited patiently for dinner. Was it too much to believe that the man was here for a meal and nothing more? After all, scythes had to eat somewhere. Customarily, restaurants never charged them for food, but that didn't mean a home-cooked meal was not more desirable. There were rumors of scythes who required their victims to prepare a meal before being gleaned. Is that what was happening here? Whatever his intentions, he kept them to himself, and they had no choice but to give him whatever he wanted. Will he spare a life here today if the food is to his taste? Citra wondered. No surprise that people bent over backwards to please sides in every possible way. Hope in the shadow of fear is the world's most powerful motivator. Think about those times when you were in the shadow of fear. Was hope your most powerful motivator? And if so, why? I can say in my darkest moments, hope most certainly was needed and indeed was a powerful motivator. Citra's mother brought him something to drink at his request and now labored to make sure tonight's dinner was the finest she had ever served. Cooking was not her specialty. Usually she would return home from work just in time to throw something quick together for them. Tonight their lives might just rest on her questionable culinary skills. And their father? Would he be home in time or would a gleaning in his family take place in his absence? As terrified as Citra was, she did not want to leave the side alone with, her, with his own thoughts. So she went into the living room with him. Ben, who was clearly as fascinated as he was fearful, sat with her. The man finally introduced himself as Honorable Scythe Faraday. I uh, did a report on Faraday for school once, Ben said, his voice cracking only once. You picked a pretty cool scientist to name yourself after. Scythe Faraday smiled. I like to think I chose an appropriate patron historic. Like many scientists, Michael Faraday was underappreciated in his life, yet our world would not be what it is without him. Notice Ben, he's a young boy, but he's clearly bright. He recognizes the name Faraday. Do you know the scientist Michael Faraday? If not, this young boy knows more than you, and perhaps you should Google him. Uh, he was, of course, underappreciated, Michael Faraday, uh, but without him and his work with electromagnetism, uh, the technology of the modern world would not exist. I think I have you in my scythe card collection, Ben went on. I have almost all the mid-American scythes, but you were younger in the picture. The man seemed perhaps 60, and although his hair had gone gray, his goatee was still salt and pepper. It was rare for a person to let themselves reach such an age before resetting back to a more youthful self. Citra wondered how old he truly was. How long had he been charged with ending lives? Do you look your true age, or are you at the far end of time by choice? Citra asked. Citra! Her mother nearly dropped the casserole she had just taken out of the oven. What a question to ask. I like direct questions, the scythe said. They show an honesty of spirit, so I will give an honest answer. I admit to having turned to the corner four times. My natural age is somewhere near 180, although I forget the exact number. Of late I've chosen the venerable appearance because I find that those I glean take more comfort from it. Then he laughed. They think me wise. Is that why you're here, Ben Blurted, to glean one of us? Scythe Faraday offered an unreadable smile. I'm here for dinner. Okay, he's a mid-American scythe. That's a setting. That's something new. Uh, we see that it's rare for a person to uh, look the age that he does before resetting back to a youthful age. Uh, apparently, if you're of a certain age, you can reset and go back in, in your age and be younger than you actually are. He's almost 200. Scythe Faraday, having turned the corner five times. Uh, what does turn the corner mean? Uh, make an inference. Citra's father arrived just as dinner was about to be served. Her mother had apparently informed him of the situation, so he was much more emotionally prepared than the rest of them had been. 
As soon as he entered, he went straight over to Scythe Faraday to shake his hand, and pretended to be far more jovial and inviting than he must have been. The meal was awkward, mostly silence punctuated by the occasional comment of the scythe. You have a lovely home. What flavorful lemonade. This may be the best baked ziti in all mid America. Even though everything he said was complimentary, his voice registered like a seismic shock down everyone's spine. Notice uh, Neil Schusterman using the metaphoric simile uh, to help you feel what it's like to be in the room with the family. I haven't seen you in the neighborhood, Citrus' father finally said. I don't suppose you would have, he answered. I am not the public figure that some other scythes choose to be. Some scythes prefer the spotlight, but to truly do the job right, it requires a level of anonymity. Right? Citra bristled at the very idea. There's a right way to glean? Well, he answered, there are certainly wrong ways, and said nothing more about it. He just ate his ziti, and we can guess there's some foreshadowing there. As the meal neared its close, he said, tell me about yourselves. It wasn't a question or a request. It could only be read as a demand. Citra wasn't sure whether this was part of this little dance of death, or if he was genuinely interested. He knew their names before he entered the apartment, so he probably already knew all the things they could tell him. Then why ask? I work in historical research, her father said. I'm a food synthesis engineer, said her mother. The scythe raised his eyebrows, and yet you cook this from scratch. She put down her fork, all from synthesized ingredients. Yes, but if we can synthesize anything, he offered, why do we still need to synth food synthesis engineers? Citra could practically see the blood drain from her mother's face. It was her father who rose to defend his wife's existence. There's always room for improvement. Yeah, and Dad's work is important too, Ben said. What, historical research? The side weighs his fork dismissively over the notion. The past never changes, and from what I can see, neither does the future. While her parents and brother were perplexed and troubled by his comments, Citra understood the point he was making. The growth of civilization was complete. Everyone knew it. When it came to the human race, there was nothing left to learn, nothing about our existence left to decipher, which meant that no one person was more important than any other. In fact, in the grand scheme of things, everyone was equally useless. That's what he was saying. And it infuriated Citra, because on a certain level, she knew he was right. Okay. Uh, Artificial intelligence, AI, must be taking jobs, right? We can assume that. Civilization is complete. There's nothing left to learn. No one person is more important than any other. Everyone's useless. This is a word Schusterman uh, uses on purpose. I think it shows that he's read author Yuval Noah Harari in his work, Sapiens and um, uh, Homo Deus and others, because Harari talks about a future where AI will take so many jobs that we will, in fact, be useless. Uh, this seems to be an imagined future, similarly. Citra was well known for her temple, temper, and it often arrived without reason and left only the damage was done. Tonight would be no exception. Of course, you need to take a breath and respond to life calmly and coolly instead of reacting uh, out of temper, as Citra is prone to do. This is something you learn as you mature. It's a superpower if you can do it right, even amidst a storm. Why are you doing this? If you're here to glean one of us, just get it over with and stop torturing us. Her mother gasped. Her father pushed back his chair as if ready to get up and physically remove her from the room. Citra, what are you doing? Now her mother's voice was quivering. Show respect. No, he's here. He's going to do it, so let him do it. It's not like he hasn't decided. I've heard the scythes always make up their minds before the enter a home. Isn't that right? The scythe was unperturbed by her outburst. Some do, some don't, he said gently. We each have our own way of doing things. By now, Ben was crying. Dad put his arm around him, but the boy was inconsolable. Inconsolable. It's a term to define. Vocab. Yes, sides must clean, Faraday said, but we also must eat and sleep and have simple conversation. Sitter grabbed his empty plate away from him. Well, the meal's done, so you can leave. Then her father approached him. He fell to his knees. Her father was actually on his knees to this man. Please, Your Honor, forgive her. I take full responsibility for her behavior. Notice Citra's father, ready to die on behalf of his family, as any leader of a family must be willing to do. The scythe stood. An apology isn't necessary. It's refreshing to be challenged. You have no idea how tedious it gets. The pandering, the obsequious flattery, the endless parade of sycophants. A slap in the face is bracing. It reminds me that I'm human. Words to define there. Obsequious. What kind of flattery is obsequious? What's a sycophant? And why would you be sick of an endless parade of them? Then he went to the kitchen and grabbed the largest, sharpest knife he could find. He swished it back and forth, getting a feel for how it cut through the air. 
Ben's wails grew and his father's grip tightened on him. The scythe approached to their mother. Citra was ready to hurl herself in front of her to block the blade, but instead of swinging the knife, the man held out his other hand. Citra ready to die for her mother here. Tells us about her character. Kiss my ring. No one was expecting this, least of all Citra. Citra's mother stared at him, shaking her head, not willing to believe you're, you're granting me immunity? For your kindness in the meal you served, I grant you one year's immunity from gleaning. No scythe may touch you. But she hesitated. Grant it to my children instead. Notice the mother as a leader of the family. Uh, again, uh, wanting her children to benefit instead of her. Um, notice that if you kiss the ring, apparently uh, that is something that, that gives you immunity. You can't be gleaned for a year. Still, the scythe held out his ring to her. It was a diamond the size of his knuckle with a dark core. It was the same ring all scythes wore. I am offering it to you, not them. But Jenny, just do it, insisted their father, and so she did. She knelt and kissed his ring, and her DNA was read and transmitted to the Scythe Thumbs immunity database. In an instant, the world knew that Jenny Terranova was safe from gleaning for the next 12 months. The Scythe looked to his ring, which now glowed faintly red, indicating that the person before him had immunity from gleaning. He grinned, satisfied. He finally told them the truth. Uh, notice when you kiss the ring, your DNA is immediately transmitted to the Scythe Dumb's immunity database. Uh, Scythe Dumb, uh, we can guess that's the conclave of Scythes, the gathering of them. Uh, the ring grows red, indicating immunity. I'm here to glean your neighbor, Bridget Chadwell, Scythe Faraday informed them, but she was not yet home and I was hungry. He gently touched Ben on the head as if delivering some sort of benediction. Let's define that term, benediction. It seemed to calm him. Then the scythe moved to the door, the knife still in his hand, leaving no question as to the method of their neighbor's gleaning. But before he left, he turned to Citra. You see through the facades of the world, Citra Terranova. You'd make a good scythe. Facades, to find that term. Citra recoiled. I'd never want to be one. That, he said, is the first requirement. Then he left to kill their neighbor. The first requirement to become a scythe is to not want to be one. Uh, interesting point there. They didn't speak of the night. No one spoke of gleanings, as if speaking about it might bring it upon them. There were no sound from next door, no screams, no pleading wails, or perhaps the Terra Nova's TV was turned up too loud to hear it. That was the first thing Citra's father did once the scythe left. Turn on the TV and blast it to drown out the gleaning on the other side of the wall. Imagine if you were at his family, knowing what was taking place next door. What would you do? But it was unnecessary, because however the scythe accomplished his task, it was done quietly. Citra found herself strained to hear something, anything. Both she and Ben discovered in themselves a morbid curiosity that made them both secretly ashamed. Your morbid curiosity is like on the highway, and there's a car wreck, and you turn to look, even though you could see something morbid. That's your morbid curiosity taking over. An hour later, Honorable Scythe Faraday returned. It was Citra who opened the door. His ivory robe held not a single splatter of blood. Perhaps he had a spare one. Perhaps he had used the neighbor's washing machine after her gleaning. The knife was clean, too, and he handed it to Citra. We don't want it, Citra told him, feeling pretty sure she could speak for her parents on the matter. We'll never use it again. But you must use it, he insisted, so that it might remind you. Remind us of what? That a scythe is merely the instrument of death, but it is your hand that swings me. You and your parents and everyone else in this world are the wielders of scythes. Then he gently pushed the knife in her hands. We are all accomplices. You must share the responsibility. That may have been true, but after he was gone, Citra still dropped the knife into the trash. You know, we live in the state of Ohio, and as citizens of the state of Ohio, we are all accomplices. We share in responsibility when our state decides to execute a man, which we do every now and then. Ohio still executes people. We are accomplices in that. We share in the responsibility. If you don't want to share in the responsibility of that, you have to do like the Catholics do and gather at the state house and protest against capital punishment. It is the most difficult thing a person can be asked to do, and knowing that it is for the greater good doesn't make it any easier. People used to die naturally. Old age used to be a terminal affliction, not a temporary state. There were invisible killers called diseases that broke the body down. Aging couldn't be reversed, and there were accidents from which there was no return. Planes fell from the sky. Cars actually crashed. There was pain, misery, despair. It's hard for us to imagine a world so unsafe, with dangers lurking in every unseen, unplanned corner. 
All of that is behind us now, and yet a simple truth remains. People have to die. It's not as if we can go somewhere else. The disasters on the moon and Mars colonies proved that. We have one very limited world, and although death has been defeated as completely as polio, people still must die. The ending of human life used to be in the hands of nature, but we stole it. Now we have a monopoly on death. We are its sole distributor. I understand why there are sighs and how important and how necessary the work is, but I often wonder why I had to be chosen, as if there were some eternal world after this one. What fate awaits a taker of lives? Notice the structure of the novel. Uh, each chapter is bookended with journal entries, in this case by H.S. Curie. For, uh, for whom did this scythe name themselves? Ask yourself. A uh, famous scientist named Curie. Uh, Madame Marie Curie, uh, radioactivity, the term she coined. Her work, uh, all on radioactivity, earned her the Nobel Prize. Apparently, we're in some sort of futuristic society where they have a monopoly on death where the scythes decide who lives and who dies.